next in line is cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. So the glossopharyngeal nerve merges from the lateral aspect of the medulla and then passes anterolaterally, as you can see here, so forwards and laterally to the side, to then pass through the jugular foramen. This is how it leaves the cranium. It leaves the cranium actually together with cranial nerve 10 and 11 as well. So three nerves or three cranial nerves pass through the jugular foramen. It'll be 9, 10, and 11. So glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory. At this foramen, there are actually fairly small ganglia as well, superior and inferior ganglia, and they contain the cell bodies for the afferent components of the glossopharyngeal nerve because we know that the glossopharyngeal nerve has both sensory and motor and what else? Parasympathetic fibers. Remember, four cranial nerves have parasympathetics. That will be three, seven, nine, and ten. The glossopharyngeal nerve will actually follow the stylopharyngeus muscle a little bit that we can see here, which is also supplied by this nerve, and then it'll pass between the superior and the middle pharyngeal constrictors. Remember, you have three constrictors or pharyngeal constrictors and it passes in a gap between the superior and the middle pharyngeal constrictors. And that is the way how it reaches the oropharynx and the tongue. Because as you might recall from the facial nerve earlier, the facial nerve contributes the special sensory fibers to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Well that leaves one third of the tongue left over, doesn't it? Well, and that will be the posterior one third. And that is indeed supplied with special sensory, so taste fibers via the glossopharyngeal nerve. And the nerve name is once again a beautiful example for how the name in anatomical terminology indicates what is innervated or what the function of something is because the glossopharyngeal nerve is afferent from the tongue and the pharynx, glosso and pharynx. So tongue and pharynx, it makes complete sense, doesn't it? And the efferent fibers go to the stylopharyngeus muscle and the parotid gland. Because you might also recall that the glossopharyngeal nerve is the one that supplies the parasympathetic fibers for the parotid gland, right? So, glossopharyngeal nerve is here, the parotid gland is here, and the secretomotor fibers to the parotid gland hitch a ride on the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of cranial nerve 5, the mandibular division, and then they reach the parotid gland. In addition to the already discussed modalities conveyed by the glossopharyngeal nerve, there's something else. There are fibers that go to the carotid sinus and the carotid body. You may wonder, what is the purpose of this? Well, the carotid sinus nerve will supply the carotid sinus, which is a baroreceptor, that's a pressure receptor. So that's going to be sensitive to changes in blood pressure. And the carotid body, which is, in that case, a chemoreceptor, which is sensitive to the blood gas, so oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. It's a good place to have it as well, because it's right here at the junction of the internal and external carotid artery. So we always have blood that has come basically directly from the heart. Remember, you have from the heart through the aortic arch, then you have through the brachiocephalic trunk on the right side, and on the left side you have the left common carotid artery directly coming off. And so this blood is actually not being used up by anything, so this is exactly where we should measure the blood gas uh, without having any of the oxygen used up yet by any of the bodily functions.